Death and the Maiden Written by Pit Viper of Doom Read for you by Gemini Wishes Chapter 4 Dance Macabre They crack through the vault security. David can hear Sam sigh of relief from halfway across the room. A few moments and all this will be over, one way or another. He can already foresee the exit strategy for these people. For Sam. For... for himself as well. He's glad it's over. The sooner it ends, the sooner he can stop seeing Toshi standing helpless and alone with a gun pointed at him. He knows it's irrational, and he knows there's no real danger, but it's not an image he ever wanted in his head. The vault boxes are unlocked. Sam rushes forward to remove the right one from its compartment, open it, and put an end to this. And then the room gets cold. No. That's not quite right. The temperature stays the same, he's sure of it, but the fine hairs on his arms and up the back of his neck are standing on end, his skin rippling with goosebumps, and the phantom chills make the room feel colder than it really is. The gunman breathes in sharply. David turns around, confused, and... The thing is, he knows many heroes. He has worked with them and for them, and none so closely as All Might. Style is just as much their bread and butter as combat and rescue. It's one of the first lessons any wet-behind-the-ears sidekick learns. Heroes that don't get noticed don't get paid. It's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Heroes arrive with light and noise and fanfare, David knows. Only then can the battle begin. When David finishes turning around, the battle is over. The gunman guarding Toshi is on the ground, unconscious, and it is only then that the battered, ragged boy standing over him speaks. Hello, Dr. Shield. Midoriya Izuku's green eyes bore into him from across the room. Dr. Arnold, it's safe now. The moment the words leave his mouth, a second figure steps through the doorway on unsteady legs. David's heart drops to his stomach. Melissa? Papa! She breaks into a run and crashes into his chest, hugging him fiercely. She looks... she looks awful. Her dress is a torn, scorched mess. Some of her hair is missing, a section of it hacked off while the rest is a tangle. And her arms... Her arms. You're bleeding. Suddenly his heart isn't heavy anymore. The dread disintegrates, broken down by cold fear. He pulls back to get a better look at her, and bites back a cry at the bruise blooming next to her eye, the red and swelling. Someone hit her. Someone struck his daughter. Oh, God, Melissa, what? I'm okay, she sniffles, on the edge of tears but not quite crying. She's brave, so much braver than he is. They're just scratches. Izuku and the others, they've been protecting me, but Papa... Her voice cracks. Papa, we have to get to the control room. We have to stop them. This is wrong. This is already wrong, but it's horrifying now. He should have fought this. He should have spoken up. Damn the consequences. And now... Now it's too late. Now there's an unconscious actor on the floor in Melissa. But... I don't understand. He whispers, half to himself. I don't... Melissa, how did this happen? Who hurt you? Click. Behind him, Sam unlocks the metal box and lifts the lid. Sam? Melissa frowns at him. It's okay. Whatever they told you to do, you don't have to anymore. Once we disable the security, we'll... Her voice trails off when she sees that he isn't listening to her. David doesn't notice Midoriya slipping past them until the boy steps down on the open lid, nearly slamming it shut on Sam's fingers. That's very rude, he says. In a voice so cold, David half expects the boy to breathe out frost clouds. She's talking to you. Pay attention. Sam hesitates. His eyes flicker from one face to the next. They linger on David's face last before returning to the boy standing over him. You children, he says quietly. You stupid children. You couldn't just sit still and do as you were told, could you? The silence is thick. Melissa is frozen where she stands staring at Sam with eyes as wide as saucers. And why wouldn't she? Sam Arnold is a family member. He's eaten at their dinner table more nights than not. He's been her unofficial academic advisor since she was twelve years old. Toshi sighs deeply. There are many things in that sigh. He sounds tired and worried, as if someone's placed a weight on his shoulders and he isn't sure how long he can hold it. He does not, however, sound surprised. Toshi, David says uncertainly. I didn't want to believe it, he says. But I know fear when I see it. There had to be a reason he wasn't afraid, and there had to be a reason that neither of you fought back, even though they only posted one sentry with us. His face is bleak. David, 
Please, please tell me you didn't. David opens his mouth and shuts it again. His throat closes off. He wasn't. Midoriya's voice breaks the thick silence, calm and cold as a clear sky in winter. Not this time, at least. David looks at him, shocked. The boy's scarred face and green eyes give nothing away. Well, Dr. Shield, he asks. Do you want to tell them, or should I? Papa? He can't look at her, but he does anyway. Looks into her big blue eyes with all that fear and confusion. Papa, what's he talking about? Yes, David. Toshi says softly. What is he talking about? This is the part, he thinks, where he's supposed to say that no one was supposed to get hurt, or that it wasn't what it looked like, or perhaps that it wasn't personal, except it was, in a sense. There were a number of cliches crafted exactly for this sort of moment. I, I called it off, is what comes out. This wasn't supposed to happen, I swear to you. I called it off, I put a stop to it. And I expected better of you. Sam cuts him off, sharp and chiding, picking up their discussion right where it left off before Toshi first arrived. We both watched the disaster in Kamino. I thought you of all people would have realized how necessary it- Sam, it was wrong, he says desperately. You still realize it, don't you? Sam presses. Even now. That's why you didn't fight back. Or were you simply worried about losing an old friend's good opinion? Because I have to say, Dave, that's awfully selfish of you. Midoriya jabs him sharply in the throat. It's a harmless poke, not intended to hurt, but even a gentle blow to the throat is enough to make someone stop talking. Papa, what's going on? Melissa's voice shakes, but there's a hard edge to it now. He didn't want this. He never wanted this. When he called it off, he meant for it to be one black spot that he would carry in his heart, never to see the light of day. We created something. Pulling words from his mouth is like pulling his heart from his chest, because Melissa is wide-eyed and frightened and Toshi just looks tired and disappointed. A device. It was designed to maximize the power level of someone's quirk and allow them to wield it safely at that level. Six months ago, we created a successful prototype. It was meant to be a tool for heroes, to allow them to increase efficiency and success rates. It was meant to help people, but the board of directors didn't see it that way. They shut down the project, Sam rasps. Took the prototype, research, locked it away where it couldn't help anyone. So you decided to steal it back? Toshi says incredulous. By aligning yourself with villains. Dave, how could you possibly- The security breach, Melissa says, before David can try to defend himself by correcting him. At the start of the summer, that was- that was you, wasn't it? It was a trial run, he says. The words taste like bile. Testing the security system and its limits. We hired someone to steal just a piece of the research just as a proof of concept. But it went wrong and we were detected. The expo that was our window was pushed back and I called it off. He turns to Toshi. I called it off for good, Toshi, I swear to you. I didn't want any of this. Liar! Midoriya snaps, and David flinches like he's been struck. I called it off, he repeats. Regardless of how I felt, I called it off. It wasn't even a Tokumino that- He stops short. That's saying too much. I just don't understand why, Toshi says pleadingly. Dave, you're the most brilliant man I know. It would have taken time, but you could have recreated it. You didn't have time, Toshi. Toshi goes still. After everything you told me about your condition, you didn't have time, David rasps out, hating how his voice breaks. And now, now you can't even use your quirk, can you? Toshi doesn't answer him. From his pocket, he draws the device. Not the device, that's in the box at Sam's feet. But it's a near thing. Imperfect and incomplete. You're not wrong. After the first failure, I started rebuilding, with the notes we recovered. I got this far, and then Sam told me to bring this to the reception. To swap them out, Sam says bitterly. No one would be the wiser. Toshi, David pleads. I know it was wrong, but I didn't... I didn't know what else to do, Toshi. Your quirk was going, and now it's gone, and... And this is the only way you can get it back, the only way you can still be a hero. How dare you? David opens his mouth, but no more words come out. Fear rushes through his veins like liquid nitrogen, freezing off the rest of his words. You thought this was helping him? Midoriya abandons Sam to round on David, his face twisted with such fury that David steps back. 
You don't understand how desperate it is, David says, fighting to keep calm when all his body wants to do is turn tail and run. Seeing someone you care for, someone you love, lose so much, and knowing you could fix it if you could just... You call that love? Midoriya snarls. You call that caring about him? I had to do something. No, Midoriya snaps. No, you didn't. Midoriya. Toshi starts forward, hand outstretched to calm him. Hasn't he done enough? Midoriya's voice lashes at him. You saw how close it came to killing him, and now that it's finally over, you want to arm him and throw him back to the wolves? What is wrong with you? Hasn't he done enough? Hasn't he sacrificed enough? The fury leaves him shaking, green-tinged lightning darting about him as his quirk responds. He stands strong while spiderweb cracks form in what's left of David's resolve, and it all falls away to nothing. Melissa is crying. She's not shaking nor making a sound, but the tears run down her face unchecked. It's not too late to stop this, Midoriya says. His voice is quiet now, but David doesn't mistake that for calm. Call it off, now, before someone gets killed. No one's going to get killed. His resolution is gone. His certainty is gone, all of it leaving him in a rush. It's all a farce. The villains are hired actors and the guns are full of blanks. No one was ever in any real danger. Melissa's streaming eyes flash and her fists clench. We've been in danger this whole time, Papa, she says. Izuku and Todoroki and Momo and everyone. And me. I've been chased and shot at, and they've been risking their lives just to help me reach you. Don't tell me there's no danger. What? I don't know about actors, Midoriya says dryly, and points to the unconscious gunman. But that guy has about eight murders on him. No. No, that's not possible. He looks at Sam. It feels like a betrayal to doubt him, to suspect him of anything but being deceived. But the look on his old friend's face tells him all that he needs to know. Sam. He didn't think it was possible to feel any lower. Sam, tell me you didn't. I don't expect you to understand. Sam tells him, instead of denying it, instead of telling him a reason not to think the worst of him. You always had such high ideals, David. Sam. It's a plea, but it's worthless now. And then you gave up so easily, he says bitterly. Don't judge me for wanting something out of this mess. The directors left us with nothing. You would have left me with nothing. At least villains pay well. He grasps the box by its handle and pulls it close. And you're wrong, boy. It is too late. Midoriya's eyes flash, and he opens his mouth to spit more harsh words. Instead, he goes rigid, eyes wide face frozen blank with horror. It's the face of someone feeling footsteps on their grave. His head whips toward the doorway, and he tenses as if to lunge for it, but Sam sees the move coming and almost tackles him to the ground. With a yell, Midoriya kicks him off and scrambles up, just as Wolfram steps into the vault. He's not alone. No! Melissa cries out. Toshi breathes in sharply. His face is a mask of cold fury, as if he's prepared to fly at the villain, the real, armed, deadly villain, with all the strength his body has left. Midoriya is on his feet, staring at Wolfram with something close to murder in his eyes. There's a boy hanging from Wolfram's grip. David doesn't know him, but he seems familiar. He hangs awkwardly, holding himself in a way that David recognizes as shoulder injury. One side of his face is encrusted with blood, still wet and running from the wound on his head. It takes David a moment to realize that the left half of his hair is supposed to be red. Sorry, Midoriya, he says. It looks like he's fighting just to stay conscious. I was careless. I'm- The safety clicks off the gun in Wolfram's hand, and the barrel brushes against the side of the boy's head. He closes his eyes and falls silent. Don't! The word leaves David's mouth at the same time as it leaves Toshi's. David steps forward, then stops. He can't trust that Wolfram won't fire if he's pushed. You should take your finger off the trigger. Midoriya's voice doesn't shake. It doesn't waver. There's no lilt to it, no trace of emotion. He's stating facts, as cold and hard and immovable as a stone wall. It isn't safe. You're very right, Wolfram says. It isn't safe for your friend at all, is it? He drags his hostage up, ignoring the boy's hiss of pain. It's not safe for you, Midoriya says. You might fire by accident, and he'll die. And then where will you be? Where will I be? Wolfram echoes. He must be smirking behind his mask. If you kill him, then what? Izuku asks, bland and matter-of-fact. Your hostage would be dead, 
and then what's to stop you from following him? David gapes at him because... Did that kid just... Interesting, Wolfram says. Is that what little heroes learn these days? Shooting to kill? I won't want to, Midoriya says. David follows his line of sight. The boy's eyes are locked on the hostage, not the villain. I promise I'll try my best not to. That's all I can offer you if you kill him. Strong words for a boy who has nothing, Wolfram taunts him. I don't have nothing, Midoriya says. Not yet. Pull that trigger, and you'll see what happens when I feel like I have nothing. The room goes frigid again. David knows it can't be his imagination now, because Melissa flinches and Sam flinches and Toshi flinches and even Wolfram's gun wavers for a moment. The only ones who stay still are Midoriya Izuku and the hostage, who watches the former with calm, trusting eyes. We're wasting time, Sam breaks the spell. I've got the device, Wolfram. Bring it here, Wolfram says. It's time we wrapped this up. Sam, Melissa whispers. Sam, please. He's a villain. You know what he'll do with something like that. Sam opens the box with barely a glance at her. You'll understand when you're older, he says. When the rich and powerful take control of you and claim every idea in your head is their own. He lifts the inner lid, revealing the device, a single headpiece of pristine titanium. Dr. Arnold, Midoriya says as Sam carries their most dangerous creation to the villain. Sam pauses. If you give that to him, what more use does he have for you? Sam sighs and keeps walking. That's the trouble with you heroes, he says. So filled with ideals and grandeur. You just don't understand business. He steps within Wolfram's reach, holding out the device. Wolfram flings the injured boy straight at Midoriya, who catches him awkwardly. Thank you very much, Dr. Arnold. Your assistance has been invaluable. And then the bastard shoots him. It's quick, too quick for David to do anything but react. Sam crumples to the ground, shocked as he clutches at his chest, as if he can keep the blood from spilling out with only his hands. The vault bows inward around them. The metal in the walls warps and shifts, and before David can blink, steel cables tear through and whip around him, holding him fast. Toshi cries out with something he can't hear, but the metal traps him mid-lunge before he can reach David. Melissa is already at Sam's side, holding pressure to the gunshot wound, and Wolfram rips up the floor at Midoriya's feet to send both him and the former hostage flying. You didn't have to do that, David grits out. He would have asked for payment for his services, Wolfram says dismissively, pulling him closer. But you? You'll create as many weapons as I ask, and your only price will be that I not have a bomb planted in your daughter's bedroom. Before David can gather enough moisture in his mouth to spit in Wolfram's face, a blow to the back of his head lays him low. There is blood on Melissa's hands. She barely remembers moving, falling to her knees at Sam's side, pressing her bare hands to the hole in his chest. She wonders if this makes her a bad person, letting a villain take Papa away while she tries to save the man who betrayed him in the first place. She can't do anything for Papa now, not against a villain like Wolfram. But this, remembering her first aid training, applying direct pressure to the bleeding, this she can do. It's the only thing she can do. The bleeding slows from pouring to trickling, filling her with hope until... Let go. It's like hearing his voice through cotton, all muffled and far away. Uncle Midas tugging at her gently. Melissa, sweetheart, let go. You did all you could. No, she chokes out. No, I almost... The bleeding, it's stopping, it's... It's because his heart stopped, Izuku tells her. His voice is neither gentle nor harsh, but hovers somewhere in the detached middle. I can... CPR, I, I can... She's not crying. This is the sort of thing that should make her cry, isn't it? Her new friends are still missing, still in danger. Todoroki's sitting against the wall, bloody and injured. A man she's known since childhood is lying still, staring blankly up at the ceiling, his blood still cooling on her hands. She's still staring at the stains when a pair of cleaner, scarred hands cover them, pushing them down and out of her line of vision. She jumps at the touch, raising her eyes to meet Izuku's. I'm sorry, he says. No! Finally, she chokes out a sob. Finally, her eyes sting and water and spill over with hot tears. No, don't. I didn't. She can feel her own panic gathering, threatening to rise past her churning stomach and racing heart to invade her mind. I was supposed to support you. I was supposed to help, but I didn't. I haven't. Melissa. I couldn't help. She sobs. I couldn't do anything. It's not your fault, Izuku tells her. You've never prepared for this. 
I have, and I couldn't help either. No one here could. But I'm going to now. He lets go, and she opens her eyes. What? Stay with All Might and Todoroki, he tells her. I'll go after Wolfram, and I'll get your father back before- So help me. One more word, and you'll regret it. She jumps, caught off guard by his harsh tone and the scowl on his face. But he's not glaring at her. He's not glaring at anything or anyone in particular. What? Don't worry. Todoroki calls over from where he's wrapping a bullet graze on his arm. That wasn't aimed at you. Okay. She's not sure what they mean, but Izuku isn't scowling anymore. How do you feel? Uncle Might asks, still close by her side. His hands shake against her shoulders. Are you hurt? I'm scared, she blurts out. I'm... I'm so scared. They... He took Papa. He killed Sam. The panic is rising again, but it feels less like panic now. It's hotter, sharper, and it only makes her thoughts even more clear. She swallows against it, trying to force it down. She's not sure she wants to know what will happen if it rises up too high. Izuku watches her with sharp eyes. You're allowed to be angry too, you know, he says. It's like you said. Villains invaded your home, took your dad, and killed your friend. How dare they? Before she can reply, his head turns as if he hears a noise. Wolfram hasn't been gone long, and Izuku stares in the direction he went, as if he can still see him through solid walls. In an instant, he's as focused as a hunting dog on the scent. They're heading for the roof, he says. Go, Todoroki tells him. We'll be fine here. Be careful, my boy, Uncle Might says. Izuku barely nods. His quirk flashes green, and he's off and running. As soon as he's gone, Uncle Might squeezes her shoulders gently and guides her away from Sam's body. She stumbles along, dimly aware that something else is wrong, something else is missing. It was important, more important than anything else, her whole reason for being here. The security system. Oh, she could kick herself. I have to go, she says. The security system. I said I'd... I have to go. Melissa, are you sure? Uncle Might starts, but she pushes away and wipes her hands feverishly on her already ruined skirt. I'm sure, I'm sure, just wait here. Melissa starts running, doubles back to retrieve her scavenged stun gun, and takes off again. Her new friends were separated one by one, by villains and rogue robots. The whole island is under siege. They invaded her home and took her father and murdered someone she's known. How dare they? Izuku is fighting for them, for Papa, for everyone's safety. She's needed. How could she have forgotten that she's needed? There's only one man standing guard at the entrance, and he isn't prepared for the stun blast she fires at him. He crumples like a bag of bricks. The security hub is nearly empty when she fumbles through the passcode and bursts inside. The chairs and control panels are abandoned. The villains have either left to attack her friends or followed Wolfram to cover his escape. She pulls up security feeds first and scans each screen until she finds what she's looking for. Her friends are all gathered just a few floors down, in the high-ceilinged chamber where Ashido and Mino stayed to hold off sentinel robots. They're all there now, even Kaminari and Kirishima, still fighting against drones and live villains alike. Melissa's hands fly over panels and buttons, and in seconds she makes sure they're only fighting villains. At her command, the robots halt their attack and turn on Wolfram's men in mass. It takes a brief moment of hunting for her to find the intercom switch. Hey, guys! She tries for cheerful but even she can hear the edge in her own voice. At least it doesn't shake. Security's back in our control. Leave the villains and head up if you can. She sees them cheering on screen, bares her teeth in a half-hysterical grin, and tries not to look at her hands. Finally, they're in business. David comes to his senses on the floor of a helicopter as it shudders and starts to rise. His vision is blurry. It's mostly dark, but there's light from the roof of the tower still leaking in. He's bound, but not gagged. Wolfram must have assumed the blow to the head and the threat of death was enough to keep him quiet. Not that shouting would do him much good, of course. His head still aches too much to do anything more strenuous than lying still and breathing, and maybe thinking if he keeps things simple. This isn't his first rodeo, obviously. Even back in their college days, it was impossible to drive around town with All Might riding shotgun without attracting dangerous attention. He's been taken prisoner before. It sucks, but he's used to it. Of course, this is the first time he's an actual target instead of a convenient hostage. And it's the first time he's ever been captured while knowing deep in his heart that Toshi isn't coming to save him. It hurts more than he ever expected. He can almost hear All Might's booming laughter and picture the dawning dread on the villains' faces when they realize that help is on its way. But help isn't coming. Not this time. Even if All Might could save him one last time, 
David has lost the right to look at him for help. No one can reach him in time to save him. He can't save himself. All he can do is try to make Wolfram's capture worthless. He wouldn't mind dying. It would eliminate any chance that he could be strong-armed into building weapons for villains. But what about Melissa? The thought comes unbidden. If something happens to you, what's to stop them from taking her instead? He's long forgotten how many times he's been threatened by villains, but David has never felt truly trapped until this moment. People call him brilliant, but his greatest creation is in the hands of a madman, and he can't even invent his way out of a single helicopter. The copter shakes in midair, jarring his aching head. It's easy to assume that the sudden movement is from a cross breeze, or the nervous pilot's shaking hands. There's no reason to believe that it's anything else. David is still fighting off despair with the memory of Toshi's laughter when, for the second time that evening, Midoriya Izuku arrives without a sound. There are cameras on the roof, with several views of the henchmen still guarding Wolfram's escape. With her friends free and clear and on their way up, Melissa watches Izuku streak past them in a blur of green and pitch himself out into empty air, straight for Wolfram's escape helicopter. Moments later, Melissa cries out when she sees him land back on the roof with Papa in her arms. For a moment, his face turns toward the camera, and his eyes glow over the feed with an almost spectral light. He's far from safe. He's alone and surrounded by villains, weighed down by Papa with nowhere to run, and Wolfram will be coming back for sure. Melissa watches with bated breath as he finds a place to set Papa down, then turns to face the villains surrounding him. They're closing in. Melissa allows herself a moment of vicious satisfaction as she activates the nearest sentinel drones and sends them to the roof. Robots pour out of their channels, slamming into the villain's scattered ranks. Melissa focuses on where Izuku and her father are, and because of that she almost misses her friend's arrival on the roof. The yellow flash of lightning catches her eye, explosions burst like fireworks, and through them she spots Kaminari, Bakugo, Momo, Ashido, and the rest. In a matter of seconds, Izuku has gone from hopelessly outnumbered to wash with help. Melissa's hands shake with the beginnings of relief. It won't be long now before the rest of the heroes arrive. Once that happens, it'll all be over. The villains are hopelessly outnumbered. Papa is safe. Finally, everything is going to be okay. All at once, the screens go out. Melissa jumps, confused, and her relief slowly drains when the controls fail to respond to her. The building shakes. An ominous groaning reaches her ears before... That's odd, she thinks, with growing dread. Are the walls bowing inward, or is it just... She doesn't finish that thought. She's off and running again, abandoning the control room as the building begins to buckle and warp around her. She finds her uncle hurrying out of the vault as she passes, supporting Todoroki, and exchanges a single glance with them before they all race up to the roof. The villains are almost all gone, but it's the least of their worries now, with the tower heaving like a ship caught in a storm. Hope is cruel, David thinks, as he watches the figure high above balanced on a column of twisted metal. How could he have thought everything was going to be all right? How could he have forgotten that Wolfram still had the device? Midoriya crouches over him, offering what little protection his body can provide against all the metal in the tower rooftop tearing itself apart, shifting into something new and warped and dangerous. They won't fall, he thinks. Wolfram still wants him. The villain is too smart to risk killing the Golden Goose. But their escape is cut off. David can't tell where the roof exit is anymore and who even knows what this warping has done to the floors below. The floors below. Melissa was down there. Papa! David chokes on a sob, and then another when pain lances through his aching head. Melissa is running straight for them over the ruined rooftop, with Toshi and the injured boy close behind. Go back, he tries to yell, but it comes out as a hoarse croak, and Melissa doesn't slow down, even as the rooftop ripples again. The floor tears itself apart at her feet, and Melissa screams as she almost falls, but stumbles past the growing gap and keeps running. Toshi has stopped, with the boy leaning heavily against his side. They can only watch helplessly as the section of the roof where David, Midoriya, and now Melissa are, breaks away and shifts far out of their reach. Melissa collapses at his side, and he struggles to sit up and hug her, damning his aching head. She's filthy and battered from her long night, and her hands are bloodstained but David holds her close and lets her tremble in his arms. No matter. David draws back against the broken wall he's leaning on, pulling his daughter with him as far back as they can go. Wolfram has lowered himself closer to their level, the device affixed to his head. His eyes have darkened, and his voice is warped from its effects. This serves my purpose even better than capturing you alone, Dr. Shield, Wolfram says. Perhaps with your daughter close at hand... 
It'll be easier to remind you what's at stake if you try my patience. You're really trying mine right now, Midoriya tells him. An arm of metal bursts from the column and swings out at him. Midoriya dodges the worst of it, but it still clips him and flings him into the wall just out of David's reach. He slides to the ground, breathing harshly with pain. Papa, don't listen to him. Melissa clings to him fiercely. No matter what he says or what he does, don't listen to him. David doesn't reply. It's not a promise he's sure he can make, even if the world were to hang in the balance. I am impressed, Doctor. Wolfram continues. The rooftop heaves again, metal shrieking against the strain. I have never felt more alive. With devices like these, I could be as powerful as that villain. My former benefactor, if you will. Perhaps you may have heard of him. I hope you become the next all for one. Izuku sways on his feet, still leaning against the wall. His voice is calm, lilting, almost dreamy. Do you know why? Because he's dead now, Wolfram. Would you like to find out how? Another swat of metal slams him back into the wall again. This time, when he slides limply to the ground, he doesn't get up again. Something explodes in the distance, and Wolfram's pillar rocks. There's a gaping hole in it now, almost perfectly round and cannonball-sized. Two more strikes follow, and Wolfram lets out a distorted growl and gathers more metal beneath them and around him, building himself higher and higher. In seconds, he towers above them, and there's no trace of any gap or weakness in his defenses. A wall of metal slowly rises at the edge of the gap, blocking off any chance of another attack of that caliber. More of Momo's cannon fire rips at it, but Wolfram continues to build and build until his defenses are impenetrable. I'm sorry. There are few words more useless than I'm sorry, David thinks. Being sorry won't go back and fix anything. It won't save them. It won't take away the power that he helped deliver into Wolfram's hands. Instead of answering... Midoriya forces himself to sit up and shoves his hand into David's coat pocket. What are you- I have a question, Midoriya says, as he pulls out the second device, the backup, recreated from only a fraction of the original notes in David's own memory. Does this thing actually work? You can't possibly mean to use it, David says. A yes or a no is fine. Y yes, David tells him. For the most part, it won't enhance one's quirk to that degree, but it's a close thing. I was close. Well then, Midoriya says, still in that drifting, dreamy tone. Let's hope it's close enough. Wait! Melissa cries out, reaching over David's body as if to pull the device out of Midoriya's hands. Izuku, what about your quirk? Todoroki says it injures you if you use it too much. If you put that on, it'll be even stronger. You can't, David says. This is new information. He never would have answered honestly if he'd known that. Not for me. If your quirk injures you, then enhancing it could kill you. Yeah, I know, Midoriya says, turning the device over and over in his hands. Then, without another word, he puts it on. His back hits the wall as his body tenses, and his eyes squeeze shut. David once tried the device on himself, and he remembers the alien rush of something. It was mild for him. There's only so much you can enhance with a quirk like flexible fingers. He can't imagine what it must be like for someone like Midoriya. When Midoriya's eyes open, the green is ringed with solid black, and the pupil glints with a faint reddish light. Almost immediately, he shuts his eyes again, hands flying to his ears. Oh. His voice isn't distorted to the point that Wolfram's is, but there's an eerie reverberation to it, as if he's speaking from the bottom of a deep well. Oh, wow. Well, should have expected that. That's a lot. That's... Slowly, his eyes slide open again, and his hands loosen. That's a lot, he whispers, hushed as if in wonder. That's a lot. Yuzuku? Melissa asks. What are you talking about? Papa, what's happening? I... I don't know. The boy's quirk is strength enhancement, isn't it? Why would it affect his senses? The eerie eyes turn to them, glowing faintly in the night. With his pale face and dark hair, he looks like a ghost. So, he says, obviously you'll need to keep quiet about what I'm pretty sure you're about to see. Before David can ask what he means, Midoriya lights up with his quirk, all crackling green energy and glowing veins. It gathers from within him, glowing brighter and stronger with each passing second, before it finally bursts outward in a powerful shockwave. David's mouth falls open when he sees what it leaves behind. 
The first thing Melissa sees is a little girl, standing in a spot where there hadn't been a little girl just a few seconds ago. She's small and cute, dressed in white with long dark hair and pale skin, and her eyes are black, sort of like Izuku's, only they're all black. Melissa can't even see light glinting off of them. Melissa looks around, and there are others flickering into view, people standing all around them, all over the roof. A few of them are dressed as heroes, but most are just regular people, only pale and strange and glowing with a faint greenish light. Their eyes are gone, solid white, with no iris or pupil. They look just as surprised to be seen as Melissa feels surprised to see them. Izuku lifts his hand and points. A few of the heroes, men and women in police uniforms, businessmen in suits, scowling men who look like street thugs, a girl who looks like she just got off a barista shift, except the stain on the front of her uniform is too red to be coffee. They all watch him as he points them out, men and women and elderly, mothers and fathers and heroes and bystanders and people. So many people. See them, he says. He killed all of them. Not all at once. A few here and there. He probably thought they were nothing, doing it like that. But it all builds up, and they don't forget. They never forget. His ghostly eyes turn to Melissa and her father. They're all like that. The villains, I mean. Wolfram brought so many murderers with him. Melissa's hands are sticky her skin stiff with dried blood. She hears her father gasp, follows his shocked gaze, and... There's Sam, pale and hollow-eyed, standing among the rest. He meets her eyes for a moment, then looks away. Thank you, Izuku says, but he's not talking to her anymore. You all helped us a lot. I need your help with one last thing, though. You name it. One of the cops laughs darkly. A lot of us have been waiting for a while. A ragged dead man laughs darkly, blood trickling past his lips. Say the word. Izuku smiles, and Melissa's blood runs cold even before he answers. Make him pay. He doesn't shout it, but the crowd shifts almost as one, and it's then that Melissa sees. This part of the rooftop is covered in ghosts. They shift, and then they swarm Wolfram's pillar. They fly up it, climb up it, crawl up it, like a swarm of ants. Wolfram responds, lashing at them with metal to fling them off, but nothing he does seems to harm them, only slow them down and divert them. Of course it wouldn't, she thinks a little hysterically. They can't be hurt anymore. They're dead. But they keep coming and coming, more and more pouring onto the roof and up the pillar, reaching for Wolfram no matter how many times he flings them off. In the spaces they leave behind, more ghosts take their place. A man rushes by, dressed in a U.S. naval uniform from centuries past an airline pilot, a grizzled man in an oilskin raincoat, a woman who looks like she just stepped off the Titanic. Melissa can't even feel scared anymore. It's like a vivid waking dream passing all around her. The air is thick with the smell of the ocean as the dead swarm the rooftop and the pillar and finally Wolfram. People that the villains have killed, and people that the sea has killed. Something glints as if it falls from the high pillar. It's the device, Papa's invention that Wolfram stole. It smashes against the remains of the rooftop, fragments skittering across metal and concrete. High above them, Wolfram screams. They're all very lucky, Toshinori thinks distantly. Yayirozu passed out after one last cannon barrage against Wolfram. Kaminari ran his wattage to the limit again. Ashido tried to take on four villains at once and got knocked silly and taken out of the fight. Asui climbed down the side of the building to inform the heroes below of the situation. Bakugo dragged Kirishima downstairs to clear the rest of the tower of any remaining villains. And so, the only ones who witnessed the dead rising to join the fight are those of them who already know why they are there. He was disappointed when Nana wasn't at his side when it happened, but not quite surprised. She must be in the thick of the fighting, where she is most needed. They can only watch in stunned silence. Toshinori, Todoroki, Ida, and Araraka. None of them speak because what is there that can possibly be said? They witness the dead rise in vengeance, joined by countless others who look as if they crawled up from the depths of their own watery graves. I can't believe I picked a fight with him the first time I talked to him, Todoroki says. You could have died, Araraka says faintly. Todoroki shrugs. I would have haunted him. Beneath Wolfram, 
The pillar of metal buckles under its own weight, and it all comes crashing down. The heaving and shaking of Wolfram's quirk manipulating the metal in the tower finally stops. An eerie, haunting cry rises from the crowd, strengthening to a roar of wild triumph. The tide of ghosts shifts again, converging around the spot where Wolfram must have fallen. The villain screams again, and Toshinori's heart seizes. Are the dead going to kill him? The answer comes in the very next moment, when the ghosts vanish. The night air falls silent. Todoroki pulls out of his grip and limps toward the gap that Wolfram had torn into the roof, separating them from Izuku and David and Melissa. Ice bridges the gap, and his legs give up beneath him. Aburaka catches him before he falls. That's it, Todoroki says. That's all I have. Toshinori rests a hand on his shoulder. That's all we need, young Todoroki, he murmurs. Just rest. Between Asui, Bakugo, and Kirishima, I'm sure that help is on the way. Todoroki nods, and Toshinori leaves him in the care of his friends and crosses the bridge. He finds the three of them tucked up at the foot of a fragment of wall still left standing. David has a tight hold on his daughter. They're awake and all right, relatively speaking. Izuku's eyes are closed, his back propped up against the wall. There's a device in his hand, the one that David showed them earlier in the vault. He's pale and limp but breathing. Toshinori gathers him in his arms without thinking, and almost chokes on his relief when the boy weakly hugs him back. Are you all right? He asks. He feels Midoriya's hands curl into his shirt before his student gives an answer. They saw, he whispers, too softly for the shields to hear. You should tell them what really happened to your quirk. Toshinori presses his lips together. His first instinct is to say no, but that's only habit speaking. All for one is dead, and his quirk is passed on. There can be no more danger in telling. His student sighs quietly and goes limp, but he still breathes. Enhancement or no, wielding his quirks that way has left him exhausted. Toshinori's heart crumbles. This was supposed to be a vacation, a break from fear and desperation and violence. Toshinori raises his head and finds David staring at him, still cradling Melissa in his arms. His old friend, his old love, does not apologize aloud. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't need to. His eyes hold more regret and guilt and fear than words ever could. They'll have to talk about this. Maybe they'll both have to be a little more honest with each other. And David, even if he wasn't directly responsible in tonight's conflict, he still might be in trouble for his past involvement. It won't be as dire as what Sam Arnold would have faced had he lived, but he'll need a friend. Toshinori needs friends. He's pushed far too many of them away over the years. Without a word, Toshinori reaches out and pulls the shields into his arms. Melissa finds Izuku at one of her favorite spots on the island. It's tucked away between a few buildings, hidden enough to be private but wide enough to be cheery. It's technically a courtyard, and one with a fantastic view of the ocean, facing west for those great sunsets. He's not watching the sunset now. He sits cross-legged on the wall that encircles the courtyard staring out at the endless sea and sky. It's the morning after the attack, and the expo's main events have been delayed another day while all the details get squared away and the injured recover. There isn't much for them to do now that they've given statements, and Todoroki's still sleeping off several layered healing quirks, so Melissa isn't surprised that Izuku has gone exploring. She comes up behind him, a little uncertain about where they stand now. Hunting for a way to break the ice, she grasps the first possibility that comes to her. A... Hey, uh, Izuku? She winces. Was that too casual? He doesn't answer her right away, and it's only because she moves closer that she hears his soft, Hi. What are you looking at? She asks. There's no splendid sunset, no sea animals, no birds. Usually the empty sea is the first thing people get bored of here. Ghost ship, he replies, never taking his eyes off that single point on the horizon. She stares at him. Are... You being serious, or... You'll never know for sure, will you? Hesitantly, Melissa sits down next to him. Guess not. Is it cool looking? Yeah, it's got pirates. That's the best kind. She still can't tell if he's joking or not, but she decides that he isn't, because a ghost pirate ship sounds awesome and she would rather live in a world where it exists. They sit in silence for a while, Melissa watching the blue-green surface... Izuku may be watching a ghost pirate ship. It's peaceful. Quiet. Everything that last night wasn't. You okay? 
she asks, chancing a glance at him. He closes his eyes. Tired, he says. But okay. If I was really bad, I wouldn't be talking. Melissa nods. The island's not usually like that, I promise. I mean, you could probably tell because I didn't handle that very well. The first time I ever faced a felon, he almost suffocated me under a bridge. Isaku tells her. I didn't get one hit in. I had to be rescued. You helped a lot. So you're doing better than me, I think. Oh. There's not much more that Melissa can say to that. Well, thank you. Hmm? For what you did last night. For going after Papa and... Just everything. And please actually accept it, because I've been trying to thank everyone else and they tell me it was nothing and it really just wasn't. It meant a lot to me. And, she added quickly, I won't tell anyone about, you know, the ghosts. Izuku smiles. It's a lot less scary than the smiles he put on last night. No one would believe you. The cameras didn't catch anything, and the only people who saw it besides Wolfram were you, your dad, and a bunch of people who already know. Is it ever scary? Melissa asks. Seeing ghosts? Sometimes. But it's okay. I just have to reframe it. What do you mean? Well, for the first time, Izuku turns and looks at her. Were you scared last night? Of me? It's okay if you were. A, a little, she admits. I mean, I trust you, and you're a hero. I just... Some of the stuff you said or did, it was like a horror movie, but... But in a good way, I think? This time he grins. I'm gonna be the scariest hero one day. The villains will be wetting themselves at the thought of facing me. I don't know, Melissa says. You kind of felt like a real hero already. Well, you gave us some real support, Izuku tells her, even though you were scared and sad. So maybe we're both coming out ahead. He pauses. How's your dad? He's still resting up, she answers. His injuries were pretty minor, and, um, he's mostly not in trouble, I guess. He's more in trouble with the board of directors than he is with the law, because he compromised their security before, but that's just... Restrictions on his work, and a probationary period, and they're disposing of the quirk enhancers. Both of them. Good, he says firmly, which surprises her. Nobody should have that kind of power. Even if it's used for good? Melissa points out. Like you did? He takes a while to answer. You saw the others, right? The ghosts from the sea? Melissa's stomach turns. Uh, yeah? They didn't have any stake in what happened last night. They didn't care. Most of them have been here so long, they don't really do feelings anymore. He draws in a deep, slow breath. They helped because I made them. That's how far that thing blew up my power. I wasn't just talking to the dead. For a second, I was controlling them. I was feeling everything they felt, and they were feeling everything I felt. And we just fed into each other so much that... That's why I took it off. I didn't want it going any farther. If they killed him, or if they went out of control and hurt someone else, I'd always wonder if it was partly because I made them. And I don't need that. I don't want that. Melissa hugs him. He doesn't struggle or tell her to get off, so it's probably okay with him. I'm sorry about your friend, he says, his voice muffled by her hug. Even if... I'm just sorry. Yeah, she says. She's been trying not to think about Sam. Me too. And... Thanks for not freaking out, he adds. I, um, I get nervous about telling people, so thanks for being cool about it. It's a much happier topic than what happened to Sam Arnold, so Melissa latches onto it with all her might. Are you kidding me? She pulls back. My new friend-slash-pseudo-cousin brother can talk to the dead, and I'm in on the secret. That's rad. Izuku stares at her, clearly caught off guard. Wait, where did brother come from? I mean, I'm flattered, but... When did I upgrade to brother? Don't tell me you haven't noticed the looks our dads have been giving each other. Izuku laughs. No, he cackles. It's pure glee after he's been quiet and reserved for the entire day she's known him. Are you serious? <laughs> she grins impishly at him. You'll never know for sure, will you? He looks so betrayed that she has to giggle before turning back to watch the ocean for a ghost pirate ship that she'll never see. And all around them, High Island rocks in the current of the sea, too vast for its passengers to feel each movement. It drifts on, 
floating miles above shipwrecks and plains and sunken treasure. The End <laughs>